I welcome everyone to the Foreign Policy Association uh, event tonight. I am delighted to introduce you to Siddharth Kara, the author of a new book, Cobalt Red, How the Blood of the Congo Powers Our Lives, uh, which is a New York Times bestseller. Uh, you can see the cover of the book there. Uh, we actually have copies uh, that are for sale, $25 each, um, out uh, at the entrance. So, you know, please uh, feel free to buy a copy if you'd like. Uh, um, I'm now going to tell you a little bit about uh, Sid Harth. Uh, after graduating from Duke University, uh, he started down the well-trodden path to Wall Street. He worked as an investment banker before taking a U-turn and becoming an author, researcher, and activist, and is now considered one of the world's foremost experts on modern slavery. Uh, his path started the summer after he received his MBA at Columbia. He embarked on several self-funded journeys across the world to research human trafficking and contemporary slavery. Siddharth has traveled to more than 50 countries uh, to document the cases of thousands of enslaved people and child laborers. He's written four books uh, about these experiences. His first was adapted into a Hollywood film, uh, Trafficked. Another book won the Frederick Douglass Book Prize, and a feature film uh, inspired by his latest book, Cobalt Red, is now in pre-production. Uh, Sid Harth is currently a British Academy Global Professor and has been a lecturer at the Kennedy's uh, School of Government at Harvard and at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Sid Harth Kara. mic here and switch on my snazzy pocket mic. Is that working? Yeah, yeah? okay. Um, thank you so much, Reed, for that gracious introduction and for um, recommending me to the Foreign Policy Association um, to talk about this issue. And thank you, of course, to the Foreign Policy Association for graciously hosting us in this um, Wonderful auditorium this evening. Um, I'm, I, uh, I'm giving this my first sort of public remarks on the book. It was released on January 31st. I've done quite a few interviews in the news media, uh, podcasts. Everyone seems to have a podcast, so uh, lots of podcasts um, on this topic. Uh, but I haven't been too eager to get up on stage and talk about it as of yet, but this seemed like a really wonderful opportunity to come here to New York City, uh, speak uh, in this wonderful forum uh, to this terrific uh, group of people uh, concerned with issues such as this. So um, I have some remarks that I'd like to uh, present to you this evening about uh, Cobalt Red, and then I'm very happy to do some Q&A, and if anyone wants a signed copy of the book, we can do that too. Let me start by asking you a question. Uh, raise your hand if you, if you happen to have a smartphone. <laughs> okay, so 99.9% .9 of us, yes? And how about a tablet, laptop, all three, yeah. right? And what about if you either own an electric vehicle or are thinking of buying an electric vehicle? So maybe a fourth of you or so. Um, the batteries in all of these devices and um, cars that I've just mentioned, almost all of them have cobalt in the battery. And they have cobalt in order to uh, create maximum energy density. Cobalt allows the battery to hold as much energy as possible while not catching on fire. Uh, you certainly don't want your phones and, and, and car potentially catching on fire, but you also want the battery to last as long as possible. So you don't have to plug it in all the time, and if you're getting an electric car, that's range. You don't want to drive around town and have to stop every few hours to plug it in. So that's why cobalt is so important. Now, three-fourths, about three-fourths of the world's supply of cobalt is mined in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And cobalt red is the story 
the truth about what's happening at the bottom of global cobalt supply chains in the Congo. And I'd like to give you a sense of what that looks like. So the story told outside of the Congo is that there's two kinds of mining. There's industrial mines that use heavy machinery, excavators, and so on. And then there's something called artisanal mining, which is a nonsensical term because it makes you think of quaint people baking bread and doing artisanal activity. But what it really means is some of the poorest people in the world using their bare hands, stri strips of rebar, shovels, spades, whatever they can find to scrounge cobalt out of the ground. And the story told outside of the Congo is these two types of mining do not intersect. That industrial is industrial and artisanal is artisanal. So when a tech company or a car company says, well, I'm buying cobalt from ABC Mining Company, there's no child mine cobalt involved or no peasant mine cobalt, no hazardous conditions. It's all done with heavy machinery. And so then we carry on with our lives. But there's a truth that's quite antithetical to that at the bottom of the chain. And I'd like to show you what an industrial mine in the Congo looks like. Uh, I've been to many of them, not all of them. They are all invariably guarded by soldiers with AK-47s and or machetes uh, to keep people like me out. Um, uh, the one I'm going to show you now is one of the biggest uh, industrial mines uh, in the Congo. And I, I got access to it. Uh, went with a guide. We drove up this road past a village called Kawama, and then up a dirt road, up a hill, higher up into the hills, and got to a gate where um, there were those guards with AK-47s. Now, I had been invited to come in and see, so they let me pass through. And then we started walking towards the main digging pit. And these industrial mines have many large pits where excavators are digging cobalt out of the ground. And we rounded across some of the uh, chewed up earth, and in the distance I could see the tail end of the Congo River, uh, which stretches across the entire heart of the African continent. And as we neared the pit, I thought, okay, industrial mine, I know, because I've already seen it, there are going to be some people here. There are going to be some kids, and they're going to be digging, probably in and around some excavators and so on. So as we near the pit, we come to the edge, and this is what I see and hear. Now, no outsider had been to this place before I got there, and it was like a thunderclap. Uh, you can't absorb, even from this video, the intensity of what was happening there. There were about 15,000 human beings crammed inside this enormous chasm. There are no excavators here. There is no industrial equipment. Uh, it's just raw, brute human force being hammered against this mountain of cobalt-bearing stone Boulders become smaller stones, become pebbles, get loaded into sacks, carried out, and stored. And I went down into this pit. Most of these gentlemen were either barefoot or had flip-flops. I had a very nice pair of Nikes uh, uh, for hiking. By the time I had gone down, walked around, and clambered back out, the heel of my shoe had torn off. There was such an intensity of sound Cobalt is toxic, so they're all breathing in toxic dust. And this was just a still image. You can't fathom that in the 21st century, at the bottom of trillion dollar supply chains, there is this kind of colonial image. You might imagine this when they're building the pyramids, but not at the bottom of supply chains linked to some of the most powerful profit-generating companies in the world who all proclaim that doesn't exist. And so this is the truth of what's happening at the bottom of the cobalt supply chain. And you can't tell from this image, but there were thousands of teenage boys and, of, co of course, grown men doing this kind of work, scrounging cobalt out of the ground, 
they're paid a few dollars a day at this particular mine for this hazardous, back-breaking uh, work that they do. Now, let's take a step back and put some context uh, into where are we in the world and where is all this cobalt coming from. It's coming from places like this, but where are we located? So this is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It occupies the entire heart of the African continent. That part that's in the red circle there is an old region that was called Katanga. It's two little provinces now, and that is where there is more cobalt in the ground in that little red circle than the rest of the planet combined. So this is ground zero for everything that is rechargeable. And the blow up of that circle shows you this sort of crescent. If you follow these blue dots, they are larger and larger deposits of copper and cobalt. And as you go northwest along this arc towards that town called Kolwezi, Kolwezi itself has about one-fourth of the world's reserves of cobalt. That is the epicenter of our rechargeable lives. Uh, and today, prior to when cobalt became uh, un un under such demand, Kolwezi was sort of a mountain town um, uh, where copper had been mined uh, going back to the 1900s, but this is what Kolwezi looks like today. This is the town. It used to be over here, and everything got bulldozed. Everyone got displaced, and now it is a giant chasm. Pit after pit after pit of land destroyed, people displaced, Forests raised, millions of trees clear-cut, water gone, arable earth destroyed, uh, people pushed to the fringes of existence, which is why they then clamber into these giant pits for a few dollars a day. So that's the bottom end of our transition to renewable energy. That's what it looks like at the bottom of the resource chain. Now, this is a mineral-rich area that was first prospected by the Belgians during the colonial period in, in the early 1900s. They first noticed enormous copper reserves. About 10% of the world's copper is in this same little arc that I showed you in those two mining provinces. And of course, copper during the industrial period was uh, under enormous demand. Um, the first Belgian geologist who prospected this area called it a geological scandal. There should just not be so much stuff in one place. There was copper, gold, diamonds, cobalt, zinc, tantalum, magnesium, uh, uh, manganese, chromium. It just went on and on and on, all these enormous mineral reserves. And that history is very important because what's happening now is not an isolated incident, but part of a longer continuum that is crucial for us to understand in order to appreciate the magnitude of violence and impact taking place today. So let me take you on a brief uh, history lesson that sets this context for what you saw in that pit. So during 360 years of the Atlantic slave trade, Europeans largely were confined to the coasts of Africa. So if you looked at a map, of Africa in 1850. This is a map from 1850. You see the coasts are pretty well understood, all these little settlements and towns and slave trading outposts. The entire interior, it says parts unknown, terra incognita. They had no idea what was in the middle, the interior. And the primary reason for that was malaria. Europeans had no natural defenses against malaria, and that kept them along the coasts. Now, in the 1860s, everything started to change with two developments. First was quinine. European explorers figured out that quinine would help them survive malaria. You'd still get sick, it would be very unpleasant, but you wouldn't die. And the second one was boiling water, used in steam engines. And that allowed boats to go upriver. So these two developments in the 1850s and 60s led to an explosion of European exploration of the interior. What's in the parts unknown? And that led 
to a dream. Maybe there, there are riches in this continent, and maybe there's a river that will go from the middle to the coast so we can get those riches out and up to Europe. And as they were looking, they thought maybe the Nile was the answer. And as they're looking for the source of the Nile, in fact, they came across the source of the Congo River here. And a particular explorer in 1877 spent three years, and he traced the entire arc of the Congolese River. And it turned out to be the one river in Africa that's, that reached deep into the interior and came out to the coast down here. The Congo River not only reached into the interior, but it had all these capillaries. So this is the Congo here, all the way down. It's the only river that crosses, crosses the equator twice. It's the deepest river in the world, and it drains an area the size of India with all these capillaries. So you could go anywhere and find a flow of water that would get you onto the Congo, out to the Atlantic coast, and then up to Europe. So now this new dream was born, to the scramble for the riches in the interior. So Otto von Bismarck convenes the Berlin Conference in 1884. And it was this imperialist extravaganza where all the great powers of Europe got together in Berlin under the civilized mission of deciding, how are we going to carve up the continent so we don't have conflict with each other, like, a, like slices of a cake. You can have this piece, France. You can have this piece, Germany. You can have this piece, Italy. OK, but I'll get this piece if you give me that, and so on. This gentleman, King Leopold of the Belgians, secured the entire Congolese interior as personal property at the Berlin Conference with promises of promoting humanitarian missions in the Congolese interior, in the African interior, and free trade on the Congo River for all the great powers of Europe. Little old Belgian was not one of them, but he, through his guile and wile, secured the Congo as personal property. It was 77 times the size of Belgium. Take a moment to look at this man's face, because he is one of the most malignant architects of human misery in history. Now, the same year that Leopold got his hands on the Congo, a fellow named Carl Benz invents this, the motor wagon. It was an internal combustion engine vehicle with steel-clad wheels. It could only go so fast before the wheels fell apart. Three years later, a Scotsman named Dunlop invents a rubber tire. And guess where one of the largest rubber tree forests in the world was located, <coughs> Congo. So Leopold is sitting on a treasure chest. And he deploys a mercenary army to terrorize and enslave the local population to gather rubber, from, rubber sap from the trees, get it down river, and up to Europe. And it's one of the most appalling episodes of pillage and genocide in human history. Estimates are that Leopold's terror squads depopulated the Congo by 50%, to the tune of up to 15 million people. Now, stories of these atrocities began to emerge, first with missionaries, and later with intrepid truth seekers, determined to uncover the realities of Leopold's slave farm. Joseph Conrad was in the Congo at that time. And what he saw inspired his excoriating meditation on the colonial desecration of Africa, Heart of Darkness. This is probably the first photograph in history that went viral. It was taken by a missionary named Alice Seeley Harris. And it memorializes the punishment that was meted out on the Congolese people by Leopold's army if they didn't meet their quota. This man is named Nsala, and he's looking down at the severed hands and feet of his five-year-old daughter, Boali. Punishment for not meeting his quota. 
And Alice, imagine her grit and fortitude as a single female missionary probing these atrocities, capturing this image. It got into a missionary magazine, and the world was shocked that this was happening, and happening for the tires on their bicycles and cars. Now, we will return to this notion of parents mourning the torture and slaughter of their children by foreign powers pillaging the Congo for its resources. This one photograph transformed public sentiment around the world and revealed a horrible truth that was in denial by King Leopold and his propaganda machine. Because great darkness always has a counterpart in history, and great evil always gives birth to the champions that will defeat it. Enter this gentleman, Edie Morell. He was a bookkeeper, a data guy. But he happened to be the data guy for the shipping line that ran all of Leopold's cargo out of the Congo, a company called Elder Dempster, based in Liverpool. He was looking at the books one day. That's for an accounting <laughs> company, after all, so that's quite apropos. Um, he was looking at the books one day, and he noticed something peculiar. So all the imports into Leopold's Congo were weapons ball cartridges, rifles, manacles, and so on. And all the exports were rubber and ivory. So he says, well, wait a minute. How are they paying the people there? And he realized that within the data alone, within the statistics alone, there was proof that something was amiss, that in fact, as he said, the natives of the Congo were being systematically robbed. But then what was the process that they were being induced to work since there was no commerce involved? There was no evidence of anything coming into the Congo that would be used to pay these people. And then he recalled the stories of the missionaries, and some of these images and pictures. And he concluded that the Con Leopold's Congo was operating by virtue of the reduction of millions of men to a condition of absolute slavery by a system of legalized robbery enforced by violence. He wrote that in 1904. And so much time has passed, but as we will see, so little has changed. Data started the campaign. But Morell's findings were not just enough. The missionary stories were not just enough. But they were enough for the British to order an inquiry to get to the bottom of what was happening. And they charged this man, an Irishman, Roger Caseman, go there and do an investigation. Caseman spent 100 days. He actually ran into Conrad while he was down there. He spent 100 days going through the upper Congo taking down testimonies from the Congolese people of how they were being treated. My hand was chopped off. My wife was killed. My baby was killed. They eat us. All of these horrors and tortures. And, he, uh, and, and, tortures. and he wrote it all up and issued a report to the parliament in the United Kingdom filled with pages of survivor testimonies and ground truth. Morell had the data casement had the truth of the voices from the ground. And they formed an organization together called the Congo Reform Association with the mission of bringing an end to this horror. And they were joined by the likes of Conrad, Mark Twain, Arthur Conan Doyle, Booker T. Washington led the campaign here in the US. And it was the first human rights movement of the 20th century. And in fact, gave birth to the concept of international human rights. Those people over there are the same worth the same as our people over here. Simple concept. And with their relentless force of will, they brought down a king. Leopold was forced to sell his Congo free state to the Belgian government. He did walk away with yet another tidy sum. In the end, he made several billion dollars in today's dollars off of this horror. Uh, but the Congo was out of his hands. Now, the Belgian government didn't do much to improve si the situation, but that's another part of the story. The genie was out of the bottle. The Congo is teeming with riches. And everyone wanted to get their hands on it. So we come to today.
the move from that to that. And that requires COBOL. And the Congo is swimming in COBOL, just like it was swimming in rubber for the first automobile revolution. Now we're in a new revolution, transitioning from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. China saw this future before anyone else did, all the way back in 2009. They signed deals with the government of the Congo passing bribes to secure massive mineral rights across that little red circle I showed you, scooping up territory that they knew was swimming in copper and cobalt as well as nickel, all these crucial battery component metals that will be needed for the rechargeable economy. So let's come back now to the present day as mining has exploded on the people of the Congo, and I, you remember there were these two categories, industrial and artisanal, and China dominating control on the ground. But as you saw in that video, that's a false dichotomy. But what does an actual industrial mine look like from space, for instance? So you saw the pit up close. This is another enormous industrial mine, and that red circle is filled with these. This, by the way, the biggest one, the biggest mining concession in the Congo is the size of London. This one's about one-fourth that size. So imagine that swath of earth ripped and gouged apart. Millions of trees clear-cut, toxic substances dumped into the air, earth, and water by mining operations, creating a public health catastrophe. So on the ground, I bore, bore witness to a rash of cancers, birth defects, thyroid disease, respiratory ailments, all kinds of consequences of the toxic pollution by huge mines like this. These two children who are handpicking out cobalt-bearing stones from worthless stones are covered in a mustardy colored powder. These mustard colored gas clouds waft out of big industrial mines like the one I showed you during the metal processing, which requires sulfuric acid. It creates sulfur dioxide clouds that then fall on everything. They don't contain the gas like they would if the mine was operating in, operating in their home country. So these clouds fall on the earth, on the water, on animals, on children, creating a range of unknown and horrific consequences. <coughs> Let's look again at environmental transformation as a result of mining, this mining activity. This is a shot taken from space in 2013. It's just south of Kolwezi, that ground zero I told you about. You can see a lake there, a lake there. There's a little village here with some huts, and there's the town up there, the, the fringes of it. Cobalt enters the scene. And in 2021, it's this. A big mine there, that lake is gone, and then this influx of people who had been displaced, now living here, and then, like the video I showed you, clambering in there to dig and earn the dollar or two or three a day. This is the heart of Kolowezi in 2013. Trees, homes, and so on. A big cobalt deposit was discovered here, and a Chinese company bought mineral rights, bulldozed the entire neighborhood, and set up a wall mining compound. All those people displaced, again, pushed to the fringes, now unable to survive, and an entire swath in the middle of the town just turned into another mine. What is, though, artisanal mining? aside from that clanking and hammering. That's the big scale of it. But what is it day to day, and how does it flow up into the phones and cars? I spent ex an extensive amount of time tracing the supply chain. And so this little map I put together with my terrific graphic art skills uh, is, in, is in the book, Cobalt Red. Tracing the supply chain to understand exactly how it ends up in the formal supply chain because the fiction told outside the Congo is, no, no, all that artisanal cobalt, including those 15,000 people in that pit, that's not coming into 
the formal supply chain. Where it's going, nobody can answer, but it's not going into the formal supply chain. So this is exactly what happens. So here's an artisanal miner. This is sort of the informal underbelly of the formal mining economy. There are traders called negotiants and little buying houses or depots. The artisanal miner will sell the sack of cobalt. Sometimes a family works together and they'll put together two sacks in a day working 10 or 11 hours. They sell it here. And then these traders sell it to the industrial mines. Now this is in the event where the artisanal miners are not already digging inside the industrial mine, in which case it's already part of their production. But when they're digging outside the industrial mine, there's this laundering mechanism, this informal underbelly which allows, which, which pulls the artisanal cobalt into the formal supply chain. And once it's at the industrial mining stage, there's no disaggregating what came from where anymore. It's all mixed together, batched, processed in sulfuric acid, and then it goes up the chain until it gets to the phones and the cars. So before it ever leaves the Congo, there's no discriminating industrial from artisanal production. So artisanal mining starts with this. This is a stone called heterogenite. And it is the dominant form in which you find cobalt in the, in the, in the DR Congo. So it's a mix of copper, cobalt, nickel, silver, and sometimes uranium. It's a little known fact that in addition to all the other things in the dirt in the Congo, there's a lot of uranium there. And in fact, the uranium that was used in the bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki came from a mine not too far from Kolowezi, and it was bought by the Manhattan Project from the Belgians at that time and put in those two bombs. So it starts with this stone, heterogenite. And there are three primary forms of activity that the local population engages in. Digging at the surface, you can almost just scrape your hand across the ground anywhere in the mining provinces and you've got copper and cobalt in your hand. So digging at the surface, rinsing and sorting stones, uh, and then tunnel digging. So here, for instance, is a large artisanal digging area with thousands of people right next to the industrial mine. The cobalt reserves don't stop at the wall. So people know, come into this area by the thousands, dig at the surface. So this is usually younger children, up to young teenagers. Dig at the surface. Here are the depots over here. So they'll dig, load their sacks, sell to the depots. Depots sell to this big mine right here. And then it's mixed into the formal supply chain. Here's a closer look at this kind of surface digging, pits and trenches. Clearly, there are children everywhere digging uh, in these pits and trenches. You can see the sacks. They're loading up for the day. Sometimes up to 5, 10 meters deep. And children, babies with babies, eking out this subhuman existence scrounging out cobalt out of the ground for a dollar just to survive, have enough money to eat food that day, and then feed it up the chain into snazzy and shiny gadgets and cars. And I talk about this encounter here with these two young girls in cobalt red. This is probably the closest I ever got to being shot. It was in the hills above a town called Cambove, uh, controlled by militias. I always had a plan with my local uh, guides we checked militia movements to make sure things were clear, but despite all best efforts, there are always unpredictable movements. And in fact, I got into this area, I talked to these two young um, mothers, 15 and 14, uh, briefly. They, they didn't really want to talk, as most people don't. And I was moving down this trench, and there were hundreds and hundreds of kids down this trench, and then suddenly there were gunshots. And this commando unit that's in charge of this area, meaning keep prying eyes out, keep the children digging, and they're on the payroll of the industrial mining company owned, owned by a Chinese mining company just nearby. Uh, they, they came and rushed at us with machetes and, and so on and were very angry. They grabbed my stuff, threw it on the ground, grabbed my phone, wanted to see if I had taken pictures. Um, and it was a very narrow escape. In fact, the only reason 
I'm probably here talking to you about this is my guide had said, before we leave town, the town of Lubumbashi, which is the mining capital, uh, and go into the mining areas, we need to get a piece of paper with the stamp and signature of someone in the governor's office so that if we ever run into a problem, you can produce this to say you're under their charge, you're under their care, you have permission. And that piece of paper is the, is the only reason uh, I made it out of this particular very uh, unpleasant encounter with these militias, uh, militia guys who are controlling this particular territory. But there are children everywhere suffering horrific injuries, shattered spines, broken legs, and then the toxic contamination, including to these babies who will be inhaling toxic cobalt dust all day, every day. At most industrial mines, if you were to just walk around, this is what you see, people climbing in, digging, selling their sacks inside, and then coming back down. Outside of the Congo, the story told by all the mining companies, by all the tech companies is that doesn't happen. There are no artisanal miners digging inside. And the truth is right there for anyone to see, just like it was in Leopold's Congo. It was right there for anyone to see. The ground truth invariably dispels the fictions told at the top of the chain. It did so now, and it did so in Leopold's time. So that's surface digging. Then there's the rinsing and sorting. So as you dig and gather stuff, you have the heterogeneite, you've got some just dirt and stones. Uh, but you have to separate all that out. So there are these rinsing pools, these toxic, cruddy pools of water where children climb in and there's a little sieve and they'll shovel out the contents of their sack, sieve it like this to separate the stones from the dirt, and then, like those two children who are covered in sulfuric acid dust, they'll handpick out the cobalt stones and throw away the other ones. And they go through that cycle repeatedly, usually family units, to fill up a couple of sacks and sell at those depots uh, to the traders. Some of the rinsing areas are actually little small ponds or even lakes, little rivers. And here you can see thousands of women and girls. Women and girls are mostly the ones and young boys who, who do the rinsing and sorting. Thousands wringing this entire pond of water here, rinsing the cobalt that's all sold to this industrial mining company. And that the company that owns this pit, by the way, is the largest cobalt producing mining company on the planet, Glencore. So it's all sold here. Now you can imagine this water has to be horrifically toxic. And when I approached this pond and I, I asked my guide to, to ask one of the young women, you know, were they aware? Are they aware of what, that there's exposure, toxic exposure to what they're doing? And the women got so animated and agitated. And the one sentence that came back after this long speech uh, in Swahili, the, the one thing he chose to translate was, she said, this water is so toxic that mosquitoes don't even bite us. And so there's enormous awareness of of what they have to endure and expose themselves and their children to just to get that couple of dollars a day because they keep being pushed out, displaced to the fringes by big foreign mining companies. This young girl is at another little lake. She's an orphan. There are thousands of orphan children digging and sorting and rinsing all around these artisanal mining areas. Orphaned by what? By mining. Her father died in a mining accident. Her mother died of a respiratory ailment. She doesn't know what it was, but I'm quite sure I know what it was. It's toxic exposure. There's so much acute respiratory disease and illness in this part of the Congo. So people die of exposure. And as you can imagine, orphans can be particularly preyed upon and exploited. Now. After the rinsing and sorting, it goes to the traders in the depots, and they look like this. Pink tarp, million dollar depot, cobalt depot, dollar sign. You go in there, they're along the road, they're all along the villages, they're little shacks like this, depot triple nine, 
Almost all of them are operated by Chinese buyers. There's also some Lebanese buyers, Russian buyers, um, Congolese, and even Indians, which allowed me to move around because people were used to seeing Indians in the mining provinces. But almost all of them are Chinese buyers. And here's the price list, depending on the grade, how much money you get. It never adds up to more than one, two, three or so dollars a day. The last thing, the worst of all, is the tunnels. As you go a little deeper, the grade of the cobalt increases. And that means you might get a little more money. So instead of two dollars, you might get three, four, or five. Now that might not sound like a big difference, but imagine we're all math people here. That's a 100 or 150 percent increase in income. That's the difference between eating a little bit and eating enough on that day. So there's this push to dig, to dig down and access those higher grade deposits of cobalt. There are at least 15,000 tunnels like this around the mining provinces, most of them in and around Kulawesi. They can be up to 120 feet deep, dug by hand by teenage boys and grown men, because it requires strength. There are no supports. There are no rock bolts. There are no ventilation shafts. Here you can see an artisanal miner starting his descent, hands and feet against the tunnel shaft going down. You could spend up to 20 hours or so down there. When they find the vein of heterogenite, they follow that along, usually parallel to the surface. Just not enough room to sit upright, just to slink along, hack at the vein, load up the sack, and then it's passed up and pulled up by a rope. So all the way down there, they have little headlights for light, little lamp. They're breathing toxic particulates. It's hot. It's humid. And the next hack against the wall could be the one that sends the whole thing collapsing. And these tunnels collapse all the time. And everyone who's inside, teenage boys and men, are buried alive. And they take those risks, endure the horror and the anguish of being down there for that survival money. I stood not far from a tunnel collapse, a tunnel complex, I should say, near Kolowezi when it collapsed. And I write about it in Cobalt Red. At a place called Kamilombe, it's the end of the journey. It's perhaps the most devastating experience I've had in more than two decades of research into slavery and child labor in dozens of countries around the world. You remember Nsala and the agony of his butchered daughter 120 years ago. So a father named Shite told me a story. He worked at a mine called Tulizembe, also owned by Glengore, no artisanal mining. And he worked hard because he wanted his son Lubo to go to school. He did not want him to have his kind of life. But one day, Shite suffered an injury and he couldn't work. Lubo was his eldest son. He said, I'll go work. And Shite said, no, I don't want you going there. But they had no way to survive. He said, I'll go until you're better. And once you're better, I'll go back to school. He was in school at the time. Well, Lubo didn't come home from Tulizembe one night. And Shite was in a terror. He ran to the mine. And I detail his story in the book, but in the end, there were 40 children who were in the tunnel when it collapsed, including Lubo. They managed to retrieve a handful of the bodies, including Lubo. And Shite, a man, his face just tortured with anguish, because it was his injury that sent his son to the mine. And he was almost better, but he didn't get better quickly enough. 
and he said, I held my son's body and begged him to come back. Uh, a mother named Jolie in Kasulo, Kasulo's in the middle of Kolwezi, where there are a lot of tunnels, told me the story of her husband, Crispin, and her son, Prosper, digging in a tunnel complex. I can see her slender body, it was crushed by grief. And she told me about this recurring nightmare that she can't breathe. She's trying to move, but she can't move. And she's clenching her teeth so hard she feels like they're going to crush and break. And then she wakes in a terror and remembers the day Crispin and Prosper were buried alive, buried alive in a tunnel collapse. And her particular horror is the opening to that tunnel was about 10 meters from her home. So she walks over their grave every day and said, I, I, I walk there and I look down and I, they're right there under my feet. And that's the cruel torture of the tunnel collapse. The bodies are rarely recovered. People are there locked down in their final poses of terror forever. And I'd like to end by just reading you one final story. And there's a reason I haven't been doing public remarks on this, because it is, it is very difficult for me. But Casement showed the world the power of the voices from the ground. And so I, I'd like you to hear one voice from the ground, not as narrated by me or summarized by me, but just a page and a half from the book towards the end. The last person I introduce you to in the book, Cobalt Red, before you, the end of the line at Kamilombe, and her name is Bissette. I spoke with her on September 22nd, 2019, just outside of Kolowezi. The day began with a cool breeze flowing down from the hills. The early morning sky was bleached by white light. I ate a quick breakfast at my guest house, consisting of an omelet with onions, boiled potatoes, and instant coffee. I headed east on the highway and arrived at a discreet guest house where I would be conducting interviews for the day. Bissette was already there, sitting at a small table with her hands folded neatly in her lap. Her skin was sallow, her face heavy and downcast. A small ovular discoloration in her skin beneath her right eye appeared like a permanent tear. There was barely any hair left on her head. She did not bother to hide the loss. The word service was sewn in tattered stitches on her olive shirt just above her heart. And she had come to tell me about her eldest son, Raphael. Bissette spoke about her son with pride. Raphael was a very kind boy. He was very smart, and he loved going to school. When Raphael reached the sixth year, the family could no longer afford his school fees. He started digging for cobalt at Mashamba East, a Glencore-owned mine. The family had a plan that once Raphael earned enough money to pay for the next year of fees, he would return to school to continue his studies. He was going to, be, he was going to go to university and be a teacher, Bissette said. He wanted that all children can learn so that they can improve their lives. As a surface digger at Mashamba East, Raphael only earned around a dollar a day, barely enough to help with basic expenses for the family, including his five younger siblings. A year passed, then another, and the plan to return to school was eventually abandoned. Once he was strong enough, the tunnels beckoned. Raphael joined a group of more than 30 artisanal miners who were digging a tunnel at Mashamba East. He left home every morning and did not return until it was dark. He was so tired every day, sometimes he would go to sleep without eating. Raphael's earnings improved as a tunnel digger to around two or three dollars a day. I did not want him to dig in the tunnel, but he said he wanted to help the family. On April 16, 2018, Raphael departed home early in the morning as usual. It was the end of the rainy season, so the big storms had passed. The air was crisp and the water was plentiful. 
I was washing our clothes with my nephew, Numbi, when my nephew, Numbi, ran into our home screaming. He also worked at Mashamba East. He said a tunnel had collapsed. He said Raphael was inside. Bisset and her husband rushed from the village to Mashamba East. As she ran, she prayed to God, please let my son be alive. When Bisset arrived at the mine, her worst nightmare was realized. No one had survived. Diggers at the site managed to retrieve a few of the bodies, including Raphael's. Can you imagine holding your child's dead body in your arms? Bisset and her husband took Raphael's body home. They washed his corpse and prepared him for burial rites. I kept waiting for his eyes to open. Raphael's death was too much for her to bear, just like Shite's loss of Lubo and Jolie's loss of Prosper. Bisset said that ever since Raphael's demise, she hardly eats, she hardly sleeps, and her hair began falling out. When my son died, I died. She did not wish to answer any additional questions about Raphael's death or her family's circumstances afterwards. She came only to recount what happened the day her son was killed. After her testimony, she stepped outside and sat quietly on the ground. I watched Bisset sitting in the heavy silence, and my thoughts drifted towards her son's final moments. Was he in pain under the avalanche of rock and dirt? Did panic take hold in the enormous darkness? Did he cry out to his mother with his last gasp of air? Questions like these must torture Bisset. They must torture every parent whose child is buried alive in a tunnel collapse. Bissette returned to the interview room and said she was ready to leave. I had arranged for a colleague to return her to her village, but she said instead she needed to go to Kamilombe. I knew why. A change came over her features that haunts me to this day. She cried out on behalf of every mother in that heart of darkness, our children are dying like dogs. That is the new Congo horror. And the fact that this manner of disregard for the humanity of African people is taking place in broad daylight in the 21st century is a shameful rejection of the purported moral advancement since colonial times. In fact, never in the history of slavery or colonial pillage has there been more degradation at the bottom of a supply chain that generated more profit at the top and touched the lives of more people around the world. But darkness always gives birth to new champions. And as the world now learns of this new Congo horror, the morel and casement and Harris of our time will be summoned to the cause of bringing an end to this vile scramble for loot that is drenched in the blood of the Congolese people that powers our lives. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sidharth. Uh, if, uh, if you are joining us via Zoom, you can use the Q&A function to ask any questions. Uh, otherwise, I'll also take any questions from the live audience. Shall I sit here, Matt? Um, yeah, that'd be perfect. Okay. Um, hi, good evening. Um, I'm going to be very upfront. Uh, my name is Yves. I'm Belgian. I worked in the Congo in the 90s. Uh, so I know a lot what is happening. Um, I know exactly what's happening there or has been happening. I used to work for NGOs. I ended up in the diplomatic world. Uh, I want to make three comments. Yeah, I think what you're telling now is exactly what's happening. Not only in Congo, I can tell you the same thing is happening in Zimbabwe, even in South Africa. Glencore is a South African company. And what I find stunning is that on the board of Glencore, you have people 
who used to be uh, freedom fighters in South Africa. Um, it's actually terrible what is happening. So I agree 200% with particularly your last comments. Uh, but it's broader than the Congo. Um, as a Belgian, um, and I'm going to step on some toes, not on your toes, but on some other toes, I agree with what you said uh, about Leopold. What I do, what I am missing, though, is a little bit, you bring in Leopold, you bring in the Belgian government, um, the figures you mentioned, 15 million, as far as I'm concerned, even one person whose hand is chopped off or feet are chopped off is, is too much. Uh, but in terms of figures, depending on the sources, we can discuss about that. Um, what I'm missing a little bit is also, I don't understand why you're bringing Leopold and then you jump to the current situation. I think if you look in particular the 50s and the 60s, and the role that, because of the resources, uranium, whatever, Congo played into the Cold War. Uh, that's a little the part. I'm, I haven't read your book. I will buy it. I'll ask you to sign it. But that's a little the part I'm missing, in the role of um, the US in that, particularly in the Cold War. Um, but it's, it's broader than that. Uh, uh, Kabila, who was friends with Che. Um, so. I'm, I'm missing a little bit that part in your uh, in your speech, uh, but other than that, fully agree. And I think what's happening is terrible. But no, thank you. Um, l l let me um, uh, say you're absolutely right. Uh, this um, resource extraction atrocity is taking place across the African continent, and it's often um, Chinese deals, um, uh, loans in exchange for resource, uh, access to resources. Um, and wherever there are valuable resources uh, needed, in particular for rechargeable batteries, um, uh, shades of this um, are being reproduced. Uh, the, the Congo and cobalt story, I think, is the extreme end of it. But there's enormous environmental and, and humanitarian uh, violence taking place at the bottom of these supply chains. I, I completely agree. I, in my book, you know, I, uh, most of my book is a journey to, to the truth. And I take people along the journey through the mining provinces to an event that I think reveals the, the deepest truth of what's happening there. Uh, but I carve out time uh, along the way to weave in the history because the history is so important. It, it, it informs everything that's happening there. And although I didn't get into it in these remarks, otherwise you'd be here all night, um, I do uh, trace um, uh, the Belgian colonial period and then the independence period and what was happening with um, U.S. interference uh, uh, at independence, the assassination of Lumumba, propping up despots, and because it's all part of a, a story of um, why the Congo is in such a bleak place. And I, 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 corruption is also a part of that. Uh, foreign interference is a part of it, and the U.S. Is, has dirtied its hands as well. Um, but as I said, that, that becomes then a longer history lesson that, uh, but it's in the book, so fear not. <laughs> Question from the Zoom audience. Is there any reasonable probability of alternative sources of cobalt which could be found elsewhere in the world? Or is the Congo the only place where uh, such large supplies are found? Yeah, so right now, um, as I mentioned, about, well, roughly half of the world's terrestrial reserves of cobalt are in that small little patch of the Congo. It's not even distributed across the Congo. It's just a small little patch in the southeastern corner. Um, and if you look at like a global production uh, histogram, it's sort of Congo's roughly three-fourths of world production. And then there's a lot of countries that are 3%, 2%, 3%, Australia, Russia, Morocco, and so on. Um, the reserves just aren't there uh, in other parts of the world uh, in any meaningful degree. Now, there, there is some talk of uh, oceanic reserves, reserves at the bottom of the ocean floor, um, and some companies that are looking into trying to exploit those. Uh, and there may be some very large um, uh, reserves at the bottom of the ocean uh, yet to be discovered. 
that introduces another conversation around environmental impact. Uh, but right here, right now, today, uh, and for the foreseeable future, it's, it's Congo. In 2010, the Congolese government inaugurated a statue in Brazzaville in the, in the memory of the Italian explorer Pietro Savornian di Brazza, who spent his life helping the people of Congo, got malaria, died of malaria, and is buried in Congo. One of his descendants, Idan Pucci, who lives in New York, went to the inauguration of the monument, and she brought back to New York a frightening photo archive describing the massacre by King Leopold. According to her, 10 million people, you say 15 or more, and many mutilated. This archive was the subject of an exhibit at the Italian Cultural Center of NYU. The exhibit made the front page of the New York Times. It caught the attention of the United Nations. They brought the archive to the UN headquarters for one month for everybody to see, but nothing happened. Last summer, the current king of Belgium, King Philippe, who is half Italian, went to Congo for the first time as a king with his wife. He, he brought with him a tooth of Lumumba, yes. because after 60 years, finally, Lumumba's body was assembled and given appropriate burial, and then brought two teeny ivory statues to the government of Congo as a sign of gesture of friendship. And in his speech that was translated in the New York Times, he said he was sorry for what uh, his ancestor had done. Mm -hmm and signed an agreement for the treatment of Ebola. Nothing else, no further comments. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, There's, uh, there were two, two of the leading explorers, um, and they were great competitors, was uh, De Braza and Henry Morton Sta Stanley. Uh, and they were in a competition to trace the Congo River first. Uh, Stanley ended up doing it, um, uh, and then he, ended up on the payroll of Leopold um, uh, to further map uh, and sign treaties with Congolese tribes to, so that he could present his case at the Berlin Conference that the Congo was his. Um, uh, there's, um, you know, the, the, the colonial history is, is uh, it's just dripping with um, misery, and, it, and it, it, there's no way around that, and, uh, you know, to, to to the gentleman's comments earlier, you know, the CIA, along with the Belgians, were um, uh, very much involved in the plot to assassinate uh, Lumumba because he, Patrice Lumumba, was the first democratically elected prime minister of Congo at independence, uh, and he understandably had a bold anti-colonial vision and a nationalist vision that the resources of the Congo should be for the Congolese people, um, and that that in and of itself got sort of neo-colonial powers. Uh, a little anxious. Um, you know, the Belgians backed a separatist leader in Katanga, the mineral province, called Moishombe. And 11 days after independence, uh, with Belgian military assistance, they annexed, they separated, seceded, chopped off the engine of the Congolese economy, which was the mining provinces. So the, the country never had a chance. And Lumumba first tried to turn to the UN to have the Belgians expelled and reunify the country. The UN sent a peacekeeping force to stabilize, but they were not charged with expelling um, the Belgian army. So he turned to the Soviets uh, for assistance. And the, the mere thought that Katanga's, the Congo's mineral riches would end up in Soviet hands and not keep flowing to the West that got people's attention. So the US, UN power brokers uh, started concocting uh, plots to assassinate Lumumba. And they, the CIA was heavily involved in this, and it's all been fairly well documented at this point. Their first option was to try to poison him with uh, poison toothpaste, um, and then that didn't work. Uh, to make a long story short, and the history is here, they, in the end, um, uh, flew him to uh, what was called Elizabethville at that time, now it's Lubumbashi, which was the head of Katanga, the mining provinces, so the Belgian stronghold, and uh, essentially uh, tortured him, killed him, chopped him to pieces, 
dissolved his body in acid, ground the bones to dust, so nothing could ever be found except the one tooth, which was held as a souvenir by one of the Belgian assassins. And that was finally returned 60 years later, last year, to Lumumba's descendants. Uh, and I, I think there's a much bigger conversation to have around colonial legacy and reparations. This I'm sorry doesn't really mean anything. I mean, it's something. Even I'm sorry means you're acknowledging that there was a, an atrocity committed, which in and of itself is an achievement because for much uh, of post-colonial history, there's either been a denial or a uh, sanitizing uh, uh, of what took place. Uh, but you know, there's no quantum for how you would repair the colonial uh, uh, pillage and the neo-colonial pillage that, that has continued in, in Africa. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a simple question. Has anybody in our government approached you and asked you about the research that you have conducted? So it's, there have been a few, uh, it's been actually fairly interesting. I didn't predict this, but um, uh, politicians on the right have taken a lot of interest in my book. Um, as a way of making points uh, or a case around uh, slowing down this uh, full steam charge into uh, electric vehicles. That, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you know that there's child slaves in Africa for those batteries? And, and so the, the right has taken this book, and that's not the point of my book, but used it to, to convey a certain message. I haven't heard anything on the left um, I've gotten the odd email from Department of Labor, Department of Energy, wanting me to talk with them um, uh, about it. Uh, but in terms of, hey, let's deal with this, no. No, nobody. Crickets. Uh, I, I think, I, well, I don't know what to think. I think um, there's some hand-wringing going on um, uh, about, well, they all sort of knew what was happening, but I think just the assumption was it'll just stay in Africa. Uh, and, and we can continue on with certain uh, initiatives. And now that the truth is coming out, I think there'll have to be some uh, reckoning about, uh, you can't just charge forward with certain important climate sustainability initiatives while trampling on people uh, along the way. Like those are, that's the old days. You know, that's Leopold's days, uh, and not to pick on him, you know, that's the colonial days, uh, not today. Uh, but there's, there's not been much by way of engagement on, so what do we do about this? How can we? The part of the problem is there's no U.S. mining companies in the Congo. The last one was Freeport McMoran, and they sold. Remember I told you one of the biggest, the biggest concession was the size of London. Freeport had that, and they sold it to a Chinese company in 2006 at the dawn of this rechargeable battery revolution. I mean, they were sitting on, literally, a treasure. I talked to the Freeport executives about it, and they had, uh, they had made some bad oil and gas bets. They had, to ha they had to cut debt, so they had to sell off territory, and this was one they got a good price for, and that's the story. But that was the last U.S. company that was in the Congo. So we, we don't even, the U.S. doesn't even have a presence on the ground to try and do things differently. Uh, and now the West is in this position of having to scramble to create alternate supply lines because China controls everything. They have 80% of mining production in the Congo, 80% of refined cobalt production, 50% of rechargeable battery production. So they have the whole chain integrated and you can't work around them, especially since they control the ground. And so now you see the US and West European countries trying to figure out, wait a minute, how did that happen? What do we do about it? How do we get our hands uh, on this supply chain? And the Biden administration signed this MOU with uh, Congo and Zambia uh, uh, just a couple of months ago to promote alternate battery metal supply chains, but they can't because they're not there. And until there's a company, a U.S. mining company on the ground, 
uh, they have to wait until it's refined through China, or you know, there's some that's refined in Finland and Belgium and other places, but it's, it's all through China. Another question from Zoom. How do we make sure companies who are expanding their EV production are sustainably sourcing cobalt? If the governments, uh, I'm assuming by the government they meant the U.S., if, if, the, if the U.S. government is unwilling to take steps to end this, what can a common citizen do? Agitate. There's nothing you and I can do. Look, one of the things that is, I think, become very apparent to people with the release of this book is we've all been made unwitting participants in a human rights atrocity. When we bought this, we didn't think, oh, kids in Africa are dying, so I can plug this in. And for that matter, anything else we plug in. You know, and especially if you're buying an electric vehicle, you, you tell yourself, oh, I'm making a green choice. That's how they've been marketed. This is sustainable. It's going to help reduce CO2 levels, and my grandchildren will have a cleaner, greener planet. And all of that is true, but the underbelly of that is an appalling invasion of the human rights of the people in the heart of Africa. Uh, and there's nothing we can do about that but get the truth out from under the shadows and into the light of day. And that's the reason I spent a little time tracing that history of Morel and, and Casement was to show that there is a model, not just a model, but there's a model for doing this in the same place, for the same purpose. And you, you start with data and you layer in ground truth because it dispels the fictions told at the top of the chain. Apple and Tesla and Samsung and Google and they all tell you, no, there's no artisanal mining at, at Glencore's mines and Huayu's mines and uh, CMOX mines. These are the big mining companies. And then you just see, no, there's actually 15,000 people crammed in that pit. So what do you mean there's no people there? And so stage one is bringing a horror out into public consciousness. And I hope that's what Cobalt Red is doing, and there are other people working on this, journalists, NGOs, and so on. The world learns of a horror, and then there's a community of conscience that's activated and says, no, this won't stand. And I don't have all the answers to what levers have to be pulled and pushed and tugged and yanked to address what you saw, but there is a sequence of levers that have to be pulled, pushed, tugged, and yanked, and there are people out there who will be activated, who will be today's Morrell, Casement, Harris, Mark Twain, Booker T. Washington, all of them banded together at a time when getting truth out into the world was much, much harder. And they will activate. There's a, whoever put the question on Zoom is one of those people right now saying, what do I do? How do I activate? What can I do as a person? And first it's awareness, the world learns, and then a community of conscience gets activated. Throughout the history of slavery, that's been the sequence of change. And it may not always be durable and lasting and as impactful as we'd like, but drip by drip, progress takes place. It inevitably does. Light always conquers darkness because I do believe I've, there, people are fundamentally, essentially, most people are fundamentally and essentially good. You know, we don't want to be participants in the offense and violence against fellow human beings. Most people don't. And when they learn about it, it bothers them. And when they realize they can't function for 24 hours without participating in that kind of violence, then it really activates people. And that's exactly what I've seen in the two and a half months that Cobalt Red has been out. Uh, thank you so much for your comments. My name is Irina. I'm uh, actually active in the energy security space as well as human rights space. And I uh, just wanted to first of make a quick note about Lumumba. He was very much used as a, uh, as a propaganda symbol in the Soviet Union. And unfortunately, what happened is the Soviet Union was no better for African countries, if not, if not worse. And today, Wagner militias are entering GRC in other countries and co-committing horrific human rights abuses for the same purpose. So, my, so that brings me to a more pra practical point, which is, from a practical perspective, these horrific conditions are also horribly inefficient. They're, they're, they're abusive, but they're also inefficient in terms of human potential, in terms of 
technology that could be making the whole thing better, faster, cleaner, without all these horrible qualities. That is not something that perhaps China or some of the others are going to consider, but US and Western countries participating would absolutely t take it into consideration. But the GRC government is so corrupt that the even entering the space from the outside with all these om omus seems to be nearly impossible. So how do we overcome from a practical perspective these obstacles that would make it possible to bring in better methods, to bring in better conditions and uh, more ethical conditions? I don't see that discussion being held in the government, even how to make it practicable. So you're, you're right. L slavery is always inefficient for every participant in the value chain except for the slave exploiter. If you actually pay people and have good working conditions, they're more productive. And you know, economists have, have gamed all this out and it's more efficient to actually pay people properly and, 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 and have them uh, work in reasonable conditions and not suffer injury and all that. But that costs something. And, and it, it's inefficient, slavery is inefficient. It's always been inefficient throughout history except for the, the rung right above the slave. Because that's the rung that either has to pay wages or not. And if you can get by with labor production without paying wages, and you're that one rung up, then you've boosted your profit. Uh, and what happens up the chain flows, flows from there. Now, part of it is there's just such a surplus of people who have no way to survive, no alternate way to survive. So in a way, if you look at the history of slavery, throughout most of history, a slave was, an, was a pretty significant capital expense because it was time consuming and expensive to get them from Africa to the colonies. And so in today's dollars, you might have spent 10, 15, $20,000 per slave running a sugar plantation in Jamaica or a cotton plantation in Virginia. Uh, and so that was, an up, that was a pretty considerable expense. And, and if that person died, it took time for that triangular trade, as it was called, to, to, to return. Well, now you've got millions upon millions upon millions of people right there who can't survive. And so their, their choice, strictly from a you know, welfare standpoint, an economic standpoint is, I do nothing and die because I can't eat. I do this miserable, horrible, dangerous, hazardous work, but I get a dollar and I can eat today. And the fact that that's the choice means the entire system above them has failed, has failed those people. That should never be the choice. And I get this argument sometimes, well, isn't, aren't they better off? At least, at least they get that dollar or two. And the fact that we're having that conversation means the entire global economic order has failed these people, catastrophically. But then you raise the point, so then, how do you improve those conditions, particularly when there's so much poor governance and corruption locally? How do you get around that or work within that? And there's another whole host of conversations that I've had with people uh, on the ground in Africa. And it's important to hear their perspective on it. Um, and I'm sure you have and others have as well. But I've asked this very question, like, you know, Lubo couldn't go to school when, when they, uh, when they couldn't pay the school fees. The school fees were $5 a month. $5 a month. And that was the difference between him, stay, him staying in school and him ending up buried alive in a tunnel collapse. The school's supposed to be free. The Congolese government is supposed to pay for that for every kid up to the age of 18. But they don't. And the mining money, of which there's a lot flowing up to Kinshasa, vanishes probably into some Swiss bank account. Uh, so there's a failure at the, at the governance level in Congo. And you're right, there's corruption. But here's what people will tell you. It's hard to wrap your heads around this, but colonialism taught Africa that government is a system of theft. It's not governing at all. It's not the welfare of the people at all. It's a system of theft. And that's being reproduced across the continent. Now, the counterpoint could be, yeah, but okay, but 
at what point is, can you, do you keep blaming the sins of your f f father? At what point do you take responsibility and govern properly? Well, for every Mandela and Nkrumah, uh, you know, there's 25 Mugabes and all who will take the, take the check from whoever the power broker is, look the other way while that resource extraction takes place. So then you come to layer two of the conversation. So one is government is theft. The second one is, yeah, but Lumumba tried. And look what happened to him. I don't want that to happen to me. So if the current leaders don't play ball, they have a not too distant uh, lesson in what, what happens to them. So you have this, these cycles of uh, uh, colonial legacy, corruption, um, but also this kind of not very distant and stark lesson of what happens if you try to run an, a country in Africa properly for your people. And I think that goes to a point, I've had a lot of debates on the ground with Congolese colleagues saying, but yeah, but it's, when does that stop? At some point, there has to be a leader who says enough is enough. And you can take me out, fine, but I'm going to stand for this. And, and, and maybe that inspires, after you chop my head off, that'll inspire the next one. And eventually, you can't just keep chopping people's heads off. I, I don't know where that point is. I know the current president, Shishikedi, is making efforts to clean up corruption in the mining sector. He's turned over a lot of these corrupt Chinese mining deals that were signed by his predecessor, Joseph Kabila, who, like his father, was as corrupt as the day is long. Uh, and just took bribes left and right and siphoned out God knows how much money um, of the country's resources. So maybe Shishiketi is the start of that um, and, and veering the country. The U.S. certainly feels he can veer the country away from China and towards the West, which may improve transparency, labor standards, and, and things like that. But time will tell. Yes, I, you know, it, it occurs to me that um, I wanted to ask a question about the industrial mines, and it almost seems like it's, it's, it's like a money laundering scheme, except it's a labor laundering scheme, because by the time it gets hey, past the industrial mines, who knows where the cobalt came from, and everybody can sort of feel good about it. Uh, one of the most devastating scenes in your book, as I read it, was the, the conversation you had with the one Chinese uh, company representative or organization representative who sort of attributed the plight of these workers to their laziness and their and and so forth. What if any confidence do you have that global pressure as awareness builds could be brought to bear on some of these mines to get them to take care of business and improve things for the people supplying them with this cobalt? You know, it's a it's a terrific question, and you know. The first part of your observation is so important to understand because you, you'd say to yourself, well, why can't it all just be done mechanically? Why, why are there people anyway? And, and for the people, of course, it's, it's survival income. But there's so much demand side pressure to boost tonnage of production. So say you're running a mining company in the Congo, and you only have so many excavators that are operating at so much time of day uh, and that's your max industrial capacity. But there's so much demand side pressure. So you say, well, there's five million people in these provinces, and we pay them a dollar a day, and by brute human force, they boost production for penny wages. And, and so that's the logic of it all. They're, they're just, they're necessary uh, to meet demand. That's what's necessary to meet demand. Uh, but what pressure can be brought to bear? Um, and the way, I the way I look at it is this. Demand for cobalt and other battery metals, but we're talking about cobalt. Demand for cobalt starts at the top of the chain. Everything downstream from that is a consequence. There are bad actors at level two, three, four, five. There's inefficiencies and corruptions at level two, three, four, five. But that entire value chain wouldn't exist but for the demand created at the top. That's Apple, Tesla, Samsung, Google, all the Chinese EV companies, all the, all the gadget and gizmo companies. That's where demand starts. And so that's where the solutions have to start. 
they have enormous market power, buying power, and the ability to, in, to demand ground conditions improve. And the reason I say that is, if you, if you read through the SEC filings of these public, publicly traded companies, you can't get this on Chinese companies, of course, they, but the US-based companies, you look through their SEC filings, and they all have disclosure statements around human rights, sustainability, and they all say, everyone, and I have, I have examples from 2021, which was the last year before the book came out, um, of these companies proclaiming that they ensure human rights standards, international norms for human rights are maintained all the way down the supply chain to the mining level. And they use the word mining level. And they reiterate their zero tolerance policies on child labor and so on. And so they say all of this already. And they say that that doesn't exist already. But it does. So really what you're saying is just do what you say you're doing. Just actually achieve the things you say you're achieving. And what would that mean? Well, instead of me being the one running around, or some journalists, or NGO workers, or whoever, you guys should have teams on the ground. You say there's no child labor in your supply chain, you need to have 25 people permanently stationed in Lubumbashi going up and down the mining provinces, spot checking and auditing these places and making sure, in fact, there are no children. You say that artisanal cobalt doesn't merge into, you should have people on the ground because you're only doing this to validate the claims you're making. You see, the claims are made and everyone just accepts it because, well, the truth hasn't come out yet. So now, is it, so these companies have sufficient buying power. Now what they do is they sit back and say, well, Glencore said there's no child labor. Uh, Huayu Cobalt said there's no child labor. CMOC, China molybdenum, another big, Zijin Mining, uh, they all, there's no child labor. Oh, okay, so the SEC disclosure, we have uh, you know, ver uh, verified statement from our mining supplier that there's no child labor. You mean to tell me they're actually taking at face value the word of all these Chinese companies vis-a-vis -vis human rights? Come on, right? So they need to interrogate that and be on the ground. It wouldn't cost much. It's, it's not a hard problem to solve. And that's the other tragedy here. It is way more complicated to figure out how to make one of these from scratch than to get on the ground in the Congo and make sure people are being paid properly. That's the simple problem. This was the hard problem. An EV with 350 miles plus range was the hard problem. This is actually not the hard problem. But then why not solve it? It's those people over there and not our people over here. You think they'd send the kids of Cupertino into these pits? No. Kids of the Congo? No problem. That's the problem. That's why I spend a little time on the colonial period, because in a way, nothing's really changed. Instead of kings of countries, it's kings of industry but it's the same philosophy. Those people are disposable and their resources are ours to pillage however we wish. Thank you very much, Sidharth, for your comments and for making this very important book. Um, if everyone can join me in just thanking Sidharth one more time. <laughs>